This is the seventh video in a series where I cover everything you need to know to build a GPS receiver from scratch. In the previous video, we spoke about the tracking stage, which, among other things, tracks signals over time and decodes fragments of navigation message bits. In this video, we'll cover the decoding stage, which groups those fragments of bits into whole bits that form higher level structures containing the information we need to determine our location. Let's start by exploring the structure of the navigation message to better understand what it is we're decoding. At the lowest level, the tracking stage emits a 20th of a navigation message bit each millisecond. These are called pseudosymbols to emphasize the fact that we don't yet know how they map to binary zeros or ones. Once we've received enough of them, we can collect them into groups of 20, each corresponding to a bit of the navigation message. At this point, we still don't know how they map to binary zeros or ones, so I like to call them pseudo bits. Thankfully, patterns in the pseudo bits allow us to eventually determine the mapping, turning them into regular bits. Bits are collected into groups of 30 to make words. A word is a grouping of bits, where some of them are used for data and some are used for error detection and correction. Words are collected into groups of 10 to make subframes. A subframe is a higher level structure containing some of the parameters we need to compute our location. For example, the satellite's clock or orbital parameters. There are five types of subframes, each containing different parameters. And finally, subframes are collected into groups of five to make frames. A frame is a collection of the five different types of subframes. After subframe five of a frame has been transmitted, it starts again at subframe one. The goal of the decoding stage is to decode all of this information and forward it to the next stage, the solving stage, where we use it to calculate our location. Let's start by talking about how we group pseudo symbols into pseudo bits, a process called pseudo symbol integration. A pseudo symbol is associated with one of the two correlation clusters. In my implementation, those associated with the left or negative cluster have a value of negative one, while those associated with the right or positive cluster have a value of positive one. While we don't yet know how these clusters map to binary bits, we do know that each bit of the navigation message is transmitted for 20 milliseconds. That means we can expect to see runs of 20 pseudo symbols all with the same value. We can determine the boundaries between different bits by collecting a large number of pseudo symbols and checking each possible grouping to find the one that maximizes similar values. For example, let's say we received these 18 pseudo symbols. I'm going to collect them into groups of four instead of 20 just so it's a little easier to see. For a proposed grouping like this, we can calculate a score, telling us how well it collects similar values. To do that, we sum the values in each group, take the absolute value of those sums, and calculate their mean to get the score. This grouping doesn't do a very good job of collecting similar values, so the pseudo symbols add destructively, and we get a low score. This grouping, on the other hand, does a good job, so the pseudo symbols add constructively, and we get a higher score. After testing all possible groupings, we pick the one with the greatest score. This tells us how to best group pseudo symbols to match the underlying navigation message bits. We only need to do this once, then we can group each 20 pseudo symbols as they arrive and determine which value occurs most frequently within the group to produce a pseudo bit. Next, we need to determine how pseudo bits map to binary bits and how to group them into subframes. This process is called pseudo bit integration. But how can we do this when BPSK modulation is inherently ambiguous? Well, it's possible because each subframe starts with a fixed 8 bit sequence called the preamble. This image was taken from the GPS specification and it shows the structure of the first word of each subframe which is called the telemetry word, or TLM word. On the bottom, we have bit numbers, and above, we have parameter names. You can see that the first eight bits are fixed. This is the preamble. We look for this sequence within our pseudo bits to tell us how they map to binary bits. To do this, 
we first collect several subframes worth of pseudo bits. Then we look for instances of the preamble and its inverse separated by the subframe length of 300 bits. This ensures we're actually matching the preamble at the start of subframes and not random bits that happen to match. Depending on the form of the matches, we'll know how pseudo bits map to binary bits. If we find this sequence, we'll know that negative one maps to one and positive one maps to zero. If we find the inverse, we'll know it's the opposite. We call this mapping the bit phase. Not only does this process tell us the bit phase, but it also tells us the boundaries between different subframes. That means we can now group each 300 bits as they arrive and send them off to be decoded as a subframe. Let's talk about how we do that exactly. I mentioned earlier that a word is a collection of 30 bits, where some are used for data and some are used for error detection and correction. The latter are known as parity bits. Before we can decode a subframe, we need to check the parity bits of each word to ensure errors haven't been introduced during transmission and to transform the data bits to their final form. The equations to do this are listed in the GPS specification. They look a little intimidating, but they're actually quite straightforward, and it's just a matter of translating them to code exactly as they're written. After applying them, we'll have our data bits. But how do we know which subframe to decode if there are five different types? Luckily, the first two words of each subframe are always the same, and they give us the information we need. We've already seen the first, the telemetry word. It contains the preamble we used to determine the bit phase, a telemetry message that's needed to use the military's precise GPS signal, a flag that tells us if the satellite's operating in a higher precision mode, a bit that's not used for anything, and the parity bits. For our purposes, we only care about the preamble, and we've already used that, so we can ignore the telemetry word. The second word in each subframe is called the handover word, and it contains several parameters that we'll talk about in turn. The first parameter is a 17-bit number called the truncated TOW count. To understand this number, we first need to talk about how GPS handles time. GPS started operating at midnight UTC on the night of Saturday, January 5th, 1980. The number of weeks that have passed since that night is called the GPS week number. The time of week count, or TOW count, referenced in this parameter name, is the number of 1.5 second periods that have elapsed since the start of the current GPS week. That is, since midnight UTC of the most recent Saturday night. The TOW count itself is a 19-bit number, which is large enough to cover the whole week. The truncated TOW count, however, is the 17 most significant bits of the full TOW count as it will appear at the time the next subframe begins transmission. Why is that? Why only 17 bits? Well, the least significant bit of the full TOW count, which isn't transmitted, corresponds to a 1.5 second period. The second least significant bit, which also isn't transmitted, corresponds to twice that, a three second period. The third least significant bit, which is transmitted, is twice that again, a six second period. This happens to be exactly how long it takes to transmit a subframe. That means the truncated TOW count will increment by one with each subframe we receive. That's a pretty clever way to minimize the amount of data you need to transfer. So how is this parameter useful? Well, it tells us the exact time at which the next subframe will begin transmission. That means when we start receiving the next subframe, we can calculate how long it took to reach us, the transmission time. We'll come back to this in the next stage, the solving stage. Going back to the handover word, the second parameter is the alert flag. If it's set to one, it means the satellite might be less accurate than expected. The anti-spoof flag tells us whether the military's precision signal requires cryptographic keys to use. This flag has been enabled on all satellites since early 2000, so unfortunately we can't use the precision signal. The subframe ID is an integer from 1 to 5 
telling us what kind of subframe this is. This tells us how to decode the rest of the subframe. And finally, all the remaining bits are parity bits. Now that we have a way to tell what kind of subframe we're dealing with, let's talk about the five possibilities. Subframe 1 primarily contains the satellite's clock parameters. These are used to calculate the time at which signals were transmitted and to correct for things like drift of the satellite's atomic clock. It also contains information about the satellite's health. An unhealthy satellite isn't working in one way or another and shouldn't be used in calculations. Subframes 2 and 3 contain orbital parameters. These are used to calculate the satellite's position at a particular point in time. This is what tells us where the satellite was when it transmitted a signal. Subframes 4 and 5 are special in that the parameters they contain change every frame. Over the course of 25 frames, or 12 and a half minutes, they're used to transmit information about all other satellites in the GPS constellation and Earth's atmospheric conditions, among other things. Our basic GPS receiver doesn't need any of this information, so we can ignore subframes 4 and 5. So that's an overview of the five different kinds of subframes. But how do we actually decode their parameters? Well, that depends on the parameter. Bits are straightforward. The GPS spec tells you how to interpret them. For example, if the anti-spoof bit is 1, then the military's precision signal is encrypted. Easy enough. Numbers are a little bit more complicated, though. The spec contains tables defining the properties of each number. For example, this table describes the numbers within subframes 2 and 3. You can see that for each number, it lists the number of bits it occupies, whether it's in 2's complement representation, that is whether it can be negative, and something called the scale factor. The general process for decoding a number is to parse the bits as if they were a normal integer, convert the integer from 2's complement representation, if necessary, and multiply the result by the scale factor. Once we've parsed all the parameters we're interested in, we can forward the subframe to the next stage, the solving stage, to be used to calculate our location. One last thing I want to point out is that in this table, some of the parameters have units of semicircles, or semicircles per second. However, the equations that use these parameters later in the spec assume they're in radians, or radians per second. I found it easiest to change units here while decoding to avoid confusion down the road. And that's it for the decoding stage. Let's recap the important points. First, at the lowest level, the navigation message is made up of pseudo-symbols, which are fragments of bits. As we move through the higher levels, we have bits, words, subframes, and finally frames. Second, we determine how pseudo-symbols should be grouped into pseudo-bits by collecting several bits worth of pseudo-symbols, calculating a score for each possible grouping, and picking the one with the greatest score. Third, we determine how pseudo-bits map to bits, that is, the bit phase, by collecting several subframes worth of pseudo-bits and searching for the telemetry word preamble, or its inverse. Fourth, we obtain a subframe's data bits by applying the parity algorithm. This also ensures that no errors have been introduced during transmission. Fifth, the time of week count, or TOW count parameter, in each subframe's handover word tells us when the next subframe will begin transmission, and we can use this to calculate the signal's transmission time. And finally, the five different subframes contain different parameters, but for our basic receiver, we're only interested in subframes 1, 2, and 3. In the next video, we'll cover the fifth and final stage of the GPS receiver implementation, solving. We'll learn how to take all of this information that we've decoded and use it to determine our location.